Now, I was too late for the Halifax, in actual fact, although I did see a Halifax while I was in the Air Force doing my national service. It was a rather decrepit old thing, I'm afraid, but it was still a Halifax and a very imposing aeroplane. In the hands of a good pilot, it was highly maneuverable. You could throw it around if you got attacked by a fighter or had to get out of a searchlight cone in a hurry. The Halifax bomber was the unsung warrior of Bomber Command. During the Second World War, Halifaxes flew almost 39,000 operations over enemy territory. As well as bombs, they carried cargo and dropped secret agents. They towed gliders and pioneered electronic warfare. The Halifax was the most versatile heavy bomber in the war. Yet today, the Halifax is almost unknown, all but forgotten, but not to the men who flew her. Time has done us told that um, the Lank was better than the Halifax, but um, I particularly thought it was a great plane, wonderful plane. The Halifax was built by the Handley Page Company in Britain. Frederick Handley Page founded the company that bore his name when he was only 23. Now, he was actually a, a, an electrical engineer. He was trained as an electrical engineer, but he was bitten by the bug very early on. He saw the Wright brothers fly, and he decided to form his own company. So that was 1909. He was a classical scholar in many ways. I've seen a copy of his school report at the age of 11, where he was first in everything. Uh, he was obviously very brilliant. He actually had not that many uh, hobbies. Um, the work was his hobby, really. Uh, somebody said he was by far the more intellectual of any of the pioneers, and maybe that's true. He was very much an individualist, a very charismatic character, uh, a very hard man in many ways. Um, he was very hard on his family. He, he ruled them with a rod of iron. He, only had, he had three daughters. He never had a son, thank goodness for the son, because the son would have been in a terrible state. But nevertheless, the, the, the daughters themselves were, were pretty tough. The First World War was the making of the firm. They began their construction of heavy bombers, beginning with the O-100 and ending with the V-1500. It was one of the biggest biplanes ever built. After the Great War, Handley Page moved into commercial aviation. In 1930, they produced the HP-42 for Imperial Airways. It was one of the world's first true airliners. It carried passengers to and from Europe and the Far East in a luxury and comfort that, given today's cramped airline standards, now seems magical. In the late 30s, and with the threat of war growing, Handley Page began building medium bombers. One was the Harrow. It pioneered the building of aircraft in separate components and joining them in a central assembly. It was built too early to serve as a bomber in the war. The Harrow was followed by yet another medium bomber, the Hamden. But it was soon clear that the Royal Air Force would need something much larger and far more deadly. In June 1937, Handley Page was awarded a contract to build two prototypes of what was to be another twin-engine bomber. That later was expanded to four engines. 
the Halifax designer, George Volkert, preferred the Bristol Hercules. It was an air-cooled radial engine. But they were earmarked for other warplanes, like the short Stirling. The only alternative was the Rolls-Royce Merlin. So HP was more or less forced into going to Merlin's. And uh, that was fine. Uh, it had the right sort of power. It made a bigger aeroplane, but nevertheless, uh, it could cope. Now, Volkert didn't like that. He didn't like Rolls-Royce inline water-cooled engines. And uh, he wrote memos to all and sundry saying how awful it was. But nevertheless, he had to, had to do it. There's nothing else. The new four-engine plane was called the Halifax. The specifications called for a maximum 8,000-pound bomb load. Unfortunately, the uh, airplane, as airplanes do, grew in weight and size and got heavier and heavier, and more and more equipment had to be packed into it. It got bigger, the wheels got bigger, you couldn't retract the wheels into the nacelles, and so on and so on. The upshot was that the engines, when they arrived, they just weren't powerful enough. He needed the top-notch Merlin engines, but not unexpectedly, they were reserved for the fighters. So he had to make do with the, uh, the lower power Merlins, and uh, the aeroplane was just underpowered. It was also a draggy aeroplane, and uh, uh, there are various reasons for that. It had lots of headroom, a bigger fuselage than the Lancaster, for example. It was not quite as streamlined as it might be. There are lots of appendages which also caused drag, and that allied with the low power uh, meant that the aeroplane was a pretty sluggish performer. By December 1938, the Halifax was 20% larger and with thicker wings. But the engines were mounted as the Hercules would have been, in the middle of the wing. Unfortunately, this made the exhaust flame visible from the rear. But since it was assumed that all bombing would be done in broad daylight, no one was worried. The pace of aircraft design was accelerating, as was the approach of the war. The aircraft industry was not yet a decade out of the biplane era. The technology was new. So for a short while at least, the Halifax was as big and as modern as a bomber could get. The RAF thought it would be the only heavy bomber it would need. Initially, it was rather terrifying to fly something with four engines and that massive. A bit terrifying. Eventually, though, it became almost like a second home. And when we arrived in England, we were asked what we wanted to do, go on bombers or fighters. So we asked them, well, where's the action? Because we were all keen to do something then. And uh, they said, well, bombers is the only action at the moment. The fighters aren't doing anything. So we, we chose to go on bombers. And I think most of us did. And that's how we ended up on bombers. The first time I climbed into that Halifax, I was kind of surprised that the instructor made me get into the pilot seat and he sat over there. And I said, you mean I'm flying this? <laughs> he said, that's how you learn it. On October 25th, 1939, the Halifax flew for the first time. On that day, as had been the case throughout the entire development process, probably no one gave more than a passing routine thought to the plane's kidney-shaped tail fins. The next month, the Air Ministry ordered 500 of them. Among the heavy type bombers carrying the RAF attack into the heart of Germany is the Halifax, a four-engine giant of bomber command now being turned out in considerable numbers for the Ministry of Aircraft production by the Handley Page Company, prominent since the last war for its heavy aircraft. Strong defensive armament is provided by three bolt and pole gun turrets. One in the nose, one amidship, and the other astern, which is known as the glass house for tail end Charlie, the rear gunner. Behind her bomb doors, the Halifax can store away a maximum bomb load of five and a half tons, 
which gives this monster a fully loaded weight of 27 tons. The machine has an exceptional takeoff despite its great size and weight. When the throttles open up her four Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, the Halifax is rapidly airborne even under heavy overload conditions. Her maximum range is approximately 3,000 miles. Half that distance is still a long way into Mr. Hitler's country. Halifax bombers have long given heavy knocks and will go on dishing them out as we give Germany bombing raids on a bigger scale than she has ever handed out to us. Like the Harrow, many of the planes were assembled at Handley Page's own factory at Radlett near London. There were 40 other primary plants. In all, 6,178 Halifaxes were built. At the peak of production, hundreds of subcontractors and over 50,000 workers were employed. There were more families worked for this one firm under one roof than I've ever known in my life. I mean, sometimes you would get a whole family of five or six people, the mother, the father, sons, daughters, grandsons, they all worked. There was no parts made at Radley. It was all made at Crickerwood, all the subcontractors all over the country. Uh, 500, 500 different contractors making a bit here and there. Uh, it, it, uh, they used to say that it was made in such a way that at its maximum production, they were geared up to produce a bomber an hour. <laughs> you, you think of that, a bomber an hour. <laughs> Dispersing production was a way to ensure that if the Germans bombed one plant, the flow of aircraft would not be stalled for long. It was also Handley Page's way of doing things, this production method having been pioneered on the Harrow. The method produced an unexpected bonus. When Halifaxes crashed, they often broke up into separate, intact packages. A surprising and surprised number of crews walked away from the wreckage. Now, the reason it did that was that the airplane was built really in a sort of modular fashion. So that if the airplane hit the ground hard, it tended to come apart at the joints, and most of the aircrew tended to be in their own little boxes, and quite often uh, they would survive. The aircrew that I've talked to loved it for its strength, built built like a brick convenience, to put it politely, uh, was the, the famous RAF expression. Very strong airplane. This Halifax survived a mid-air collision over Germany and still made it home. I remember very distinctly one time coming back home after a raid in Germany. We were engaged by the batteries in Denmark in which they were very successful at hitting us. We lost two engines before we were able to cross the channel. We were losing height because we only had the two port outer engines. And we managed to land with no wheels, no flaps, cut the engines just to the last possible minute, and we landed at the aerodrome. The aircraft survived at least enough to save all of our lives. We stepped out of the plane, and the plane was an absolute total loss, but it survived and saved our lives. The Halifax's first combat operation was an attack on La Havre on March 10, 1941. Of the seven sent out, one was shot down by an RAF night fighter as it returned to England. Two days later, the Halifax became the first four-engine bomber to attack Germany. In September came the official christening. Another milestone in British aircraft production is reached when Lord and Lady Halifax visit an aircraft factory to christen a giant Handley Page Halifax heavy bomber. I wish this aircraft and all her sisters Godspeed and success 
and good luck to their gallant crews. After taking the bottle squarely on the nose, the monster four-motor monoplane leaves the hangar to circuit the aerodrome. As Lord Halifax remarked, the long-range striking power of these aircraft recalls the words of the ancient Yorkshire prayer. From Hull, Hell and Halifax, good Lord, deliver us. I hope, he said, that the time is not far distant when that prayer will be constantly upon German and Italian lips. Halifax production was soon in full swing, and production was very labor-intensive. Well, if you was a fitter, you were supposed to be able to do any fitting job. You know, that's, that's the logic of it. If you was a fitter, you were expected to do any fitting job. But normally, uh, you, would, you, would get, you would get allocated, say, one or maybe two jobs. My main job on the Halifax contract was propellers. Because we had three production lines going, we had to install 12 propellers a day on three different aircraft. And there was two of us, two fitters, one would do port side, one the starboard, we would do all the installation. Late in 1941, Halifax's attacked the battleship Tirpitz. One force landed on a frozen Norwegian lake. It broke through the ice, sank, and quietly lay on the lake bed. In 1973, it was recovered and taken to the RAF Museum at Hendon. It is the only early model Halifax left. It is displayed as if it was still lying on the bottom of the lake as a memorial. The Canadians in Bomber Command mostly flew Halifaxes, but none had been preserved in Canada. That did not stop the Halifax Aircraft Association from trying to find one of their own. As it turned out, another Halifax had also crashed in a Norwegian lake in 1945. A young man named Tor Marso heard the crash. When he was older, he began to look for the plane. They dragged for it unsuccessfully. They thought it would be in the bay close to the shore where the rear gunner was found. Eventually, they were able to uh, uh, get some sonar equipment and located the aircraft in the middle of the lake. Uh, the sonar picture, uh, when I looked at it, it looked like a Halifax that had landed and was ready for takeoff again. Except, of course, the tail was missing. So you can see the wing, E, E for One of our members was Carl Karsgaard, a pilot with Canadian Airlines. And uh, he had done some research at the Imperial War Museum and found that there was a Halifax sitting in Lake Miosa in Norway. We then said, OK, let's see if we can't get this Halifax. Let's see if we can't salvage it and bring it back to Canada. Now, the tail section, we we got out about three months before we got the rest of the airplane. It was brought over in July, August of 1995. The remainder of the aircraft took a little, little while longer. Now, this aircraft was in a depth of 750 feet. And that's deep fishing. The bomber was lost at the end of the war. In 1940, bombing was still unproven. Air Marshal Harris, CNC Bomber Command. The Nazis entered this war under the rather childish delusion that they were going to bomb everybody else and nobody was going to bomb them. There are a lot of people who say that bombing can never win a war. Well, my answer to that is that it has never been tried yet, and we shall see. When Arthur Harris took over Bomber Command, he warmly praised his Halifaxes. He thought they were the best thing since sliced bread. Like the Lancaster, the Halifax's Merlin engine's exhaust glow was visible. 
Unlike the Lancaster, it was visible from behind. The exhaust appeared above the wing. Certainly when viewed from behind, it made the exhaust pretty visible. And an awful lot of work went into trying to uh, supply suitable exhaust uh, ducts which would dampen the flame and uh, reduce the uh, visibility thereof. Unfortunately, that meant that these things got very big. And when they get very big, they get very draggy. And one particular thing that they had, which were big heat shields, uh, it upset the flow behind them so much that something like a third of the wing wasn't doing any work. And uh, that was uh, pretty disastrous from every point of view. The Halifax, while I was on it, they changed over from Rolls-Royce Merlins, which when, you, when we took off, we had been airborne a few minutes, and these things, these exhaust pipes, each side of the engine, were glowing red. And any fighter, if he got above you and looked down, he could have picked you off for miles. In some cases, you saw in the night the eight exhaust flames from the exhaust pipes, no, nothing more. And then you knew, ah, here he is, and then you went up, because then you saw him about two, three hundred meters. You went up and then you saw the big shadow. And then you saw also the four engines and then the elevator. But we looked not, we didn't look so much on the elevator and on the rudder. It was a Lancaster or Halifax. We only saw four engine plane, now get it down. In the upper reaches of Bomber Command, the Halifax's star began to fade. Another star was in the sky. The Lancaster had made its debut in March 1942. It could fly higher and deliver heavier bomb loads than the Halifax. It was new, it was glamorous, and to some eyes, even prettier. A PR dream come true. It's a bit like the Spitfire Hurricane story. The Spitfire gets all the limelight, and the Hurricane did all the hard work. So this is a bit like Halifax and Lancaster. The Lancaster got all the limelight, as it had to. I mean, there was a propaganda element in this. Uh, they had to say it was the best airplane in the world, because after all, it, you know, it was bombing Germany. Run along and jump over these. Eric Hockey flew Halifaxes during the war. This is the first time he has been in one in 60 years. Oh, that was hard work. <laughs> oh, I'm out of puff. Do with a bit of oil, couldn't on the controls. That's your throttles. One, two, three, and four. Take off. Four throttles, four throttles. Made a bit of a noise, too. Oh, tell me. Mind you, you like the feel of it. Had the brakes, you kept your brakes on until you, until the thing was really tugging at you, and then you released the brakes, and away you went. Once you're happily off the ground and starting to climb, you heaved a sigh of relief. So that was the most dangerous time, especially with the bomb on, because the aircraft was very heavy. And you climbed up very slowly. The Halifax didn't have much of a ceiling. Well, it didn't have a bad ceiling, but uh, it was below 20,000. About 17 or 18, we usually got to for our bombing trips. And uh, you'd climb up, and the navigator would give you your course and away you went. The idea was very simple. If you saw a four engine bomber, then you go right in for shooting him down and shooting between the uh, two engines where the fuselage was, uh, that we got a fire over there and that even the boys could jump out. That was the idea, no doubt about it. Mm -hmm. 
you must go right away if you recognize that it's a four-engine plane. If it is a Halifax or a Lancaster, so it doesn't matter. If it's a four-engine plane, attack right away, fast, and go away and wait until she's burning. When you go up near the target, then you have to level out, and then from then on, the bomb aimer took control of directions. He'd tell you what to do, either to slow down or to speed up, and to go left, right, and so on, and uh, keep you on course with the markers, pathfinder markers. You'd hold, hold your course, and he'd say, okay, hold on, hold on, steady, steady, and then eventually he'd say, bomb's gone, and then you did what you wanted. You usually closed the bomb doors and opened the throttles as far as wider they would go, trying to get the hell out of there. Slower, she was, the Halifax was slower and uh, lower, and uh, it was an easier prey, uh, to say so. But uh, we did not think much enough. In later, uh, in the later part of the war, we say, most cases we had Lancasters. In the earlier part, we had more uh, Halifaxes, I remember that. As the losses began to mount, the Halifax's problems were being raised at the highest level. In a memo to Churchill, his scientific advisor wrote, This aircraft has of late been suffering heavy losses. I feel I should mention that there has been a disquieting increase recently. In April, the rate more than trebled and was considerably more than double the casualty rate of any other aircraft in that month. Signed, Charwell. I'm not sure when the controversy began in terms of the relative merits of the, the Halifax and the Lancaster. And I, it's clear to see when you read the documentation coming out of Bomber Command headquarters that having initially thought that the Halifax might be the savior, and in fact in 1939 the Air Ministry believed that the Halifax would be the only British heavy bomber, uh, it, it's clear that by 1942, Sir Arthur Harris, once he'd taken over command of Bomber Command, was not at all happy with the Halifax. He thought it wasn't doing what he had expected it to do. The operational research section verified his worries in mid-1942. We think that the greater losses of Halifax, compared with other types, is due to enemy action. In all probability, fighters. The following contributory causes to the greater losses are suggested. A, that Halifax squadrons may have a larger proportion of inexperienced crews. B, that the greater visibility of Halifax exhausts, namely about 1,500 feet directly astern, enables an attacking fighter to attain and maintain attack more easily. C, that there is some doubt as to the stability of the Halifax when making evasive turns when fully loaded and equipped. In the fall of 1942, the Mark II Series I Special was introduced. Bombing was now only carried out at night. The front turret was not needed, so it was removed and replaced initially with a smooth fairing. A smaller one replaced the older, draggy, mid-upper gun turret. The plane lost some appendages and began her evolution to her final design. None of these measures increased the Halifax's altitude but they made it possible to venture into other areas of the war. In the summer of 1942, 16 Halifaxes were sent to Egypt, where they joined the attack on Rommel and the Africa Corps. As later tests would show, the Lancaster was rather delicate and not really useful in warmer climates. With some modifications, the Halifax thrived in the harsh conditions of heat and sand. The Halifaxes continued their attacks for the whole of the desert campaign, 
Operating out of bases in Palestine and Egypt, they even engaged in low-level strafing of the retreating Africa Corps. In the Mediterranean theater, Halifaxes soon began proving their versatility. In June and July of 1943, Halifaxes towed huge Horsa gliders for the invasion of Sicily. In the desert, they were accompanied by another less famous aircraft, the American B-24. I think it was like the Liberator in the US uh, Army Air Forces. The Liberator didn't have the same reputation uh, as the B-17. And gradually, this just grows up as a kind of mythology. Harris didn't like Handley Page, at least after 1942. Uh, and there is one document when it, it was clear that Handley Page were slow in uh, putting some of the modifications or applying some of the modifications to the Halifax. Uh, Harris wrote to the chief of the air staff and also to the uh, air member for supply, uh, Sir Wilfred Freeman, saying that if this were Russia, Sir, Handley, uh, Sir Frederick Handley Page and his gang would have long ago been lined up against a wall and shot. He just felt that Handley Page were very slow, very lethargic, and perhaps not all that interested in uh, putting on the modifications that were required. Whether it was a clash of egos, whether it was a sense of disappointment, uh, I'm really not sure, but he certainly, his prose is filled with vitriol. He did not like the man and he did not like the company. In a notorious memo, Harris wrote to the Minister of Aircraft Production. Our friend, the Halifax, which, as you rightly say, stinks. It consequently seems to me that most of the Halifax troubles are to be found in the wing shape and section and the engine positions. If that is so, I wonder if it would not be possible to convert the Halifax into a Lancaster by redesigning the whole Halifax wing to a more or less exact proportion of the Lancaster wing. If such an alteration were possible, we should get another Lancaster without having to go anything like as far in a general changeover. He thought they were the best thing since sliced bread, until he got the Lancaster. And then he thought they were the worst thing since sliced bread. For the crews that flew the Halifax, no thank you. I was very, very happy with the Halifax. It was a good aircraft, and you will never find a Halifax man who disagrees with me on that. They will all support the Halifax. The recovery of NA-337 was done by a Norwegian dive company specializing in underwater salvage. Most of the work was done by an ROV, a remote operation vehicle. It surveyed the wreckage of the aircraft and helped attach the custom-made lifting device. At the depth they were working, problems followed problems. The ROV was damaged by a lightning strike during a thunderstorm. It got tangled in the lifting device and had to be rescued by another ROV. But finally, the team was able to bring the Halifax up onto the beach. I recall it coming up on the beach and you could see first the tip of the starboard propeller, which had been feathered when they landed one of the tips of the balance weights on the ailerons, and then the fuselage of the aircraft and the engines and so on. It was very dramatic. I actually stood on, the, on a raft and I was able to kiss the airplane. It was that close to being there.
the idea was uh, to get into the stream. But if you were in once, then you had a chance not only to shoot one, done several, but you must be very fast because these boys looked out as well. And uh, who sees first was shot down first. We were concentrating our raid such that sometimes we would have perhaps 600 aircraft attacking a target in a, a span of perhaps 40 or 45 minutes. So it was really concentrated. Well, one advantage to us was, of course, um, the German anti-aircraft gunners, um, instead of concentrating on just you, were throwing up all their flak at everybody. So it lessened the intensity of, of flak that you faced. You can see the city and the searchlights from a long, long ways away. And as you approach it, all that happens is your mouth becomes kind of dry and you're afraid, and so you should be. But damn it, you came this far, so you may as well do it. What else is there to do? You'd look out on your port side there and you'd see one of your fellows caught in the searchlights and everybody in all the searchlight was going to be concentrating on him, which meant that they weren't paying any attention to you, thank goodness. So uh, although it may have been unfortunate for the fellow caught in the searchlight, at least it gave you a better chance. But Bomber Harris was still unhappy with the Halifax, especially with one part of the plane, as he wrote to the Ministry of Aircraft Production. There is not the least doubt that the Halifax's bad flying characteristics are killing a large number of our crews, who would otherwise not be missing from operations. Investigations have shown that over half the Halifax casualties occur to crews engaged on their first, second, and third operational flights. The trouble, of course, is that as soon as they start to throw the machine about when they are shot at, they lose control. A key reason for many losses was that kidney-shaped tail fin with its relatively large rudder. When a pilot went into a violent maneuver, it could have disastrous results. If you consider the air going past rather than the the aeroplane rushing through the air. Side slip means is when, when the air is coming in that direction. And you can do that to an aeroplane by putting a lot of rudder on it. Now, if, you want, if you're wanting to escape a searchlight beam or an or a attacking fighter, uh, the favorite tactic is to put a lot of rudder on, put the wing down and corkscrew out of it. He went into a dive, the speed built up, and he found that the airflow over the rudder would break down because of the very high slice that, that you can develop under those conditions. And when that airflow breaks down, the balance goes, and the pilots were finding they couldn't centralize the rudder, so they just were locked into the spiral dive until they hit the ground. And at least 20 instances of this were recorded in combat conditions. You develop a whole new psychology, and it's predicated on, of all things, superstition. And I can give you a very, very good example. Um, I don't think there was anyone flying that didn't carry a charm of some description. It could have been a lady stocking, it could have been something, uh, an amulet, uh, but a talisman of some description. I know I did. I had a silk scarf. I had a little pistol that I wore. This is the sort of thing. We all carried something, uh -huh. and you don't deviate from that. You carried it the first trip, you bloody well carry it the second, yeah. the third, and the 43rd if necessary. And we were out at the flights, and it was one of those rush trips. We were going to hit, uh, I think it was Con, and we'd been called early and unprepared out to the flights, getting ready. All of a sudden, I said, oh, I haven't got my gun. I haven't got my scarf. And Chester knew full well what these things were. He said, oh, for Christ's sakes, go back and get them. He was serious. 
The most amusing thing was my wireless operator. And he always took a pair of his girlfriend's knickers with him. <laughs> and he hung these above his radio set. And he did that every time. I was never able to discover whether they were the same girl's knickers every time. <laughs> And I did two operations on the Roar before I was reposted to a new 434 squadron. So uh, as a second pilot, I was sure that this was the end of the world or going to be the end of the world because two operations over the Roar and we were shot at and we were caught in searchlights and all hell broke loose and I said, to hell with it. I'm never going to survive this. Much to my surprise, I did. Over the town, there was hell. There were British bombers, 20, 30, 50 you saw sometimes. Then you saw 10 German uh, single-engine fighters. Then mosquitoes, and everybody was shooting on everybody. It was like hell. It was a turmoil, to say so. The trip was very uh, exhilarating, and you were always so pleased to get away from the target. So glad. I mean, your your spirits really lifted. You sort of thought, oh, well, that's it. The day's over. Uh, it wasn't quite, but you felt like it. We were coming home one day, and uh, we saw a bomber that was coned in searchlights, and then he was attacked by fighters. Over Denmark. Yes, over Denmark. So he dived, and they, I, I'm, I'm sure that he was right out of it, but he became confused, and he turned around 180 degrees and went right back over it again, and they shot him down. In October 1942, the Halifax Mark V was introduced. Harris was pretty tough about uh, saying, I want it right now. Uh -huh. But on the other hand, I recall reading that uh, Sir Frederick said, we know how to make the bloody airplanes. You just tell us how many you want. Uh -huh. And that, that was the end of the discussion. Uh, and I think it was nickel and diming the engineering capabilities of the uh -huh. aircraft manufacturer that probably created that situation. That's only my only Well, Henley Page made some very, very good moves, I think. And one of them, and then I think this is a time of truth. When it comes to the the powered uh, turrets on board an aircraft. Handley Page took the initiative and removed the one off the, the Mark Ones and I think the Twos and put the Perspex with the VGO in the front. One, oh. one single gun. The rudder stall problem was solved with the new, larger D-shaped tail fins. The Mark V's also had the new, smaller, less draggy mid-upper gun turret. But all Mark V's had a new, more serious defect. Because uh, a lot of Halifaxes were being made, um, it was found that the Messier company couldn't really keep up and um, they couldn't supply uh, enough undercarriages at one time. So it was decided to um, give uh, the job of doing a new undercarriage and new hydraulics to um, the Doughty company. And they produced a tubular version. And while that was useful, it was unfortunately not as strong as the other undercarriage. And it was found that you couldn't get enough weight into the aeroplane. And so its bomb load was severely reduced and therefore it was withdrawn from bombing. And it was still equipped with the underpowered Merlin engines. The highest I was ever able to get with a bomb load on with the Halifax was 18,000 feet, and lots of planes were up above us, well above us, but we couldn't get any higher, just wouldn't go up. Halifax 2s and 5s probably had a ceiling at around 18,000 feet, and on the night, and depending on the bomb load, they're probably flying between 16 and 18. 
the Lancaster and the Halifax Mark III were able to fly perhaps two, 3,000 feet above that. German night fighter pilots weren't stupid, they cherry-picked. It was far easier to find an aircraft flying lower than those in the middle of the stream. And also, the lower you flew, the more susceptible you were to what we would now call friendly fire, and that is being hit by a bomb coming from above. That happened at Pienemann. I came back with a bomb in, in my wing, one of those small ones. And uh, the little rotary propeller that armed it had caught in the uh, aluminum foil when it bounced in there. So it came back live, thank you. There was, there was luck. Lucky, <laughs> yes. Having a lank 8,000 feet above you wasn't much fun. No. <laughs> you no. couldn't shoot back. <laughs> <laughs> A dozen Canadian Air Force personnel were on hand to clean and crate NA-337. Uh, it took four C-130s to bring it back to Canada. And by the way, the Department of Agriculture had to inspect the remains of the Halifax to make sure they were clean enough to be landed in the hangar at Trenton here. The aircraft had to be totally disassembled, stripped, cleaned, and then corrosion-proofed, and then reassembled. It took two and a half years just to get the aircraft apart, or most of the parts apart. The engine took longer than that. The engine took a good part of three and a half years. Another problem was that many parts had been lost, damaged, or destroyed in the crash. When the aircraft uh, crashed, it broke in two, and this area here was uh, destroyed and uh, was, was missing. When they pulled it up, it came up in two pieces. There was the, the tail section and then the, the, the front section, and there was about 13 feet missing. And uh, we were wondering how we would be able to remanufacture that with nothing there at all. We'd have to do it all completely from drawings. Help arrived from England, from 57 Rescue, a living history and Halifax recovery group devoted to keeping the memory of the aircraft and the men who flew it alive. Well, 57 Rescue was born in 1997, but a little bit prior to that, in 1995, NA337 was recovered. And a very short time after NA337 was recovered, I discovered um, through the internet that uh, uh, this aircraft was now in Canada. I made contact with the Canadian crew and uh, asked them if I could be of any use to them. Amongst other things, 57 Rescue knew that the remains of a Halifax were on the Isle of Lewis in Scotland. And so away went up to Stornoway and uh, did a bit of research, made a few friends, and after a lot of hard work and a lot of scrambling around little farm tracks, eventually we found the fuselage section of NA-142. And uh, we checked it out. Cal Kalsgaard from Canada came across, he checked it out, decided that that's exactly what was required for the restoration team. And so uh, we made a moves with a local rugby team on Stornoway to get this fuselage section picked up, moved to Stornoway Airport, and eventually we shipped her off to Canada. What we did was got it over here and we put it in place and then rebuilt it. And it was also made, the aircraft that it came from was also made in the same factory as this aircraft. So it was done in the same jigs. So it just fit right in perfectly for us. It was uh, right here from frame 38 up to here, approximately this area here. It was completely missing. While most of the Halifaxes were dropping their deadly cargo over Germany, the Air Ministry had been taking advantage of the Halifax's unique strength in construction. The other thing that the Halifax had, which the Lancaster didn't, early in its career, it had had the Bombay shortened. And there was a, there was a, a four foot square area, which was, if you like, um, uh, isolated at the back here to be used for various things. And it was used, for instance, for the radar scanner, the H2S. It was used for parachute jumpers, who had, uh, they made a big hole there and dropped through. Amongst other things, 
Halifaxes were now also supporting special operations executive missions. On one op, a Halifax delivered an entire suite of office furniture. Halifaxes were also becoming the backbone of the Maritime Meteorology Service, as well as one of Coastal Command's most lethal weapons, harassing enemy shipping. In May 1943, Halifaxes sank five U-boats in the Bay of Biscay. But their main role was still in Bomber Command. They had been enlisted into the beginnings of electronic warfare. The Halifax in particular being a big aeroplane, large fuselage, capacious fuselage, could be fitted out with all sorts of black boxes inside. And there were many versions. Uh, one was for intelligent gathering. Another one, which was called, I think, Mandrel, carried uh, jamming equipment, which blotted out the German approach radar, or the radar that they used to look at the approach of aircraft. Every technological advantage was needed to counter the formidable German defenses. You weren't thinking about flying. All you were worried about was the flak hitting you or searchlights getting you. Often we saw planes caught in a searchlight, a master searchlight, I would think, a big one. And then there'd be about four or five more. We'd all hone in on it, and the thing would be just like daylight. And, and everybody could see you, which wasn't very pleasant. So you, uh, you just tried to wiggle out. You left, right, and diving, and anything you could do to make maneuvers to get out of the searchlights. And once you cleared them, you usually were all right again. I was watching these guys get combed ahead of me, and I counted, and they had 10 seconds. And yeah. I saw three kites blow up. And then all of a sudden, it's daylight around me, and I put the nose down, did exactly what your guy did. Rear gunner ruptured his eardrums. My ears plugged up. I couldn't hear them screaming at me because they were blowing their eardrums oh, out. They couldn't. They couldn't. And, you you couldn't. We, we, we probably did about six or 7,000 feet like that. Yeah. And the lights went out. And I'm here. We often saw planes caught in the searchlights and shot down. And they uh, just said, thank God it's not me. Just thank goodness it isn't me. You can't belabor that point too much. I mean, you're there to do a job and you do it. And you're scared to hell. Nobody can say you're gonna be brave in the face of something like this. You just have to do it. I saw them making loopings over Berlin to get rid of this. They were speeding up and then they made like this, the searchlight could not follow them. I saw they want to get out of this in any case. And uh, also the German pilots were disturbed by our own searchlights. That's a lousy feeling because by sun you are in a, in a very bright light fire and everybody is looking at you and shooting too. <laughs> this is the Mark III. Structurally, it was the same as the Mark V except that all of the Mark III's were built with appropriate undercarriages and D-shaped tail fins. Above all, it was equipped with the powerful air-cooled engines that the Halifax designers had wanted from the beginning. It took till Mark III to get a decent engine on this airplane, and that engine was the Bristol Hercules. It's a 14-cylinder radial, which means circular, not lined up this way, but 14 cylinders all working together. And uh, the airplane suddenly started to fly. And uh, she flew with the best of them. Climbed to 20, 24,000 feet along with the Lancasters. The Mark III was capable of carrying all but the heaviest bombs. Moreover, the exhaust from the Hercules engines was not a bright beacon for the German night fighters. The Halifax was now proving to be the master of all work for the RAF. At D-Day, the Halifax towed the Horsa gliders that captured the bridges 
that secured the flanks of the Normandy beaches. At Arnhem, they towed 93 gliders, including the massive Hamilcar. During Operation Varsity, the aerial crossing of the Rhine, it was the only aircraft capable of towing the Hamilcar. Air Chief Marshal Harris was still not impressed. But with the advent of the Mark III, Halifax's operational record improved spectacularly. The Operational Research Unit grudgingly confirmed this in January 1945. The efforts to improve the speed and operating height of the Halifax have resulted in lowering the casualty rate against less hazardous targets to approximately that of the Lancaster. The Lancaster was said to be worth three Halifaxes. The improvements in the Halifax have made the difference less marked. I had great faith in the Halifax. I think it was a, a good, sturdy aircraft it could certainly take battle damage, could take it as good as the Lancaster, and I think possibly even better than the Lancaster if it got severe damage from flak or fighters. Flyability of the Halifax bomber, of course, was unknown to us when we first started. But as we got to know the plane a little bit more, we liked it that much more, and, uh, and it was just solid. It would go anywhere, do anything you wanted it to. I never tried to turn one right upside down, but I had them right over on their side, and they handled very nicely. The, the thing I liked about this particular uh, aircraft is uh, it was a comfort aircraft, including the tail gunner. Um, I could uh, fly ops on this uh, wearing regular clothes. I, I had the heavy suits to wear, but it was warm enough back in that tail turret for me to be comfortable, and I, and I wasn't encumbered by all of this um, necessary uh, protective clothing until I got in the Lancaster. <laughs> well, and I, you froze I, over I and you froze back. I don't necessarily agree that uh, the Halley always was warm. No, <laughs> no uh, somewhere had in the snow drift over my head one night. <laughs> okay, you can explain that then. Something happened in between, I understand. Like the mid-upper gunner was always cold. Well, you had an electric suit, right? But I didn't wear it in the, in the Halifax. Well, my gunner did. No, I did too, yeah. Is that yeah. right? And yeah. I didn't. And feet. Yeah, well. But where Why you, were the, the boots? At 20, 22,000 feet, you're at well, minus we, 30, minus 40 degrees, something cold, like yeah. that. Uh, but uh, how Fahrenheit? often did you get up to 22,000? I know you can. Uh, pretty no, what do you mean, how often did we get up to 22,000? <laughs> that wasn't derogatory. That wasn't it's because of that aircraft. <laughs> Whatever we wanted to, let me put it that way. <laughs> Halifax's superior construction was not a myth. The Halifax had one or two other advantages. It had a rear hatch that uh, could be opened for crew to get out of. The Lancaster was smaller in the fuselage and much more cramped. And it was very difficult, I've done this myself, very difficult to climb over uh, the spars which pass through the fuselage in a Lancaster to move from one end of the aircraft to the other. And if the aircraft was bucketing about in the sky, it'd been impossible. While fewer Lancasters were lost than Halifaxes, if you were shot down in a Halifax, your chances of survival were much greater. The versatility of the Halifax was shown by its adaptation as a cargo carrier. 100 transport variants were built with a pannier mounted underneath. In 1944, the Halifax Mark VII made its debut. Its wingtips were rounded and longer than previous Halifax versions. Primarily built to support ground operations, its mid-upper gun turret was removed, and a hatch through which supplies could be dropped was added. In the winter of 1944, the Mark VII was also adapted to carry a 10-pounder cannon and a jeep in the bomb bay. A test was set up to determine if they could both be parachuted safely. The test had mixed results.
but at least the Jeep survived. One of the five major manufacturing plants which assembled the Halifax was the London Aircraft Production Group at Leavesden. In April 1945, they delivered the last one of the 710 they built. As a farewell, they gave a little fly past for all the workers. Almost skimming the crowd, the graceful plane sweeps over and above their heads as they floor above their heads. After the war, the Halifaxes remained in RAF service until 1952. Twelve were converted into airliners called the Halton. Cargo versions flew in the Berlin airlift. But by the 1960s, almost all had disappeared into scrapyards and aluminum pots. The only survivors were safe, but were hidden where few would expect to find them. One was NA-337. It was shot down on April 21, 1945, only two weeks before the end of the war in Europe, after dropping supplies to the Norwegian underground. We estimate they were probably about a mile off track and unfortunately ran over the bridge which spans Lake Miosa or the bottom part of Lake Miosa just north of uh, Oslo. There was a German ACAC battery on that bridge. They fired one clip and unfortunately hit the starboard wing of NA-337. The pilot thought that the engine had been hit, the fire had started. He feathered the starboard engine However, the fire continued, and it turned out that the fuel tank had been ruptured. We estimate he probably had five minutes of flying time left when he finally got into the ditching position. And he flew north towards the city of Hamar, and then turned south and did a controlled landing in the lake. It was a good landing from a ditching point of view. The tail hit first and actually broke off, which was quite in order. Uh, the aircraft settled on the water, was there for probably five or 10 minutes at least. We know that five of the crew of six got out. The tail gunner, Tom Waitman, was knocked out by the impact of the ditching. He came to when the water was this deep and uh, immediately undid his harness. He was finally able to release the life raft, which came out upside down. Tom scrambled aboard and drifted helplessly through the night. The rest of the crew succumbed to hypothermia. Tom Waitman was arrested by the Germans and released two weeks later when the war ended. It would take 50 more years before his plane could be released as well. I told my wife it would take two years. We are now nine years later. And you can see around you what is happening. And there's absolutely no question this aircraft, if it was of the right metals and if the engines were sound, we could fly it. It will have all the controls. It will have all the connecting rods that connect the controls. There's several hundred of these. They were even asking the other day, can we find some electrical plugs so they can complete all the electrical circuits in the aircraft? I think there's probably over 50 people who over the years have worked on this aircraft. There's probably 35 who are here every day. Some have passed away, sadly, who have been working on this aircraft. We estimate in the last two years, they've been spending approximately 17,500 hours per year volunteer work, coming in every day with their lunch bucket and remaking Halifax NA-337. There's over 750,000 rivets in the aircraft. They will all have been replaced. We were looking to get 
at least 70% of the material, or 70% by weight, of this airplane back and into the restoration, let's put it that way. And I think we're gonna be successful. No, free of the props we're not going to get. The gearboxes are authentic Halifax. Machine guns, we lost a little bit of weight there, but we're gonna get that back. We realized we couldn't restore everything. The skin had to go because it had barnacle holes in it, muscle holes in it. The magnesium just left on its own volition. And uh, some of the other components that were fabric, they left because of rot. And what we're left with, we're trying to save. So this is fantastic to see a Halifax bomber with a huge wingspan this has in a small room. And we're all anxious to see the new building, believe me, uh, to see this aircraft. Too many of the veterans today are too old and they really feel badly that they're not gonna see their beloved Halifax. So those who flew them and flew in them are very dedicated to the Halifax. Uh, we have to put the outboard wings on and the engines and there's quite a few fairings and uh, some work on the tails to put the tips on and that kind of stuff. There's, there's lots of work left yet, the Bombay doors. It'll probably take two years at least to finish it. Our objective is to perpetuate the, the maintenance of this aircraft so it will last forever, so that somebody can come in here 50 years from now and say, what is that strange looking thing? Well, then they'll be in something else as far as flying is concerned. And then the story is here, and the story about the people is here. Hopefully we can keep the memory alive of what these guys did, keep the sacrifice, um, fresh in people's minds, and hopefully nobody can forget of what these guys did for us. I feel very, very, I don't know, very emotional. This is just, it's, it's, uh, I, I, I can't really explain how I feel. There's so many thousands of hours, uh, over a quarter million hours, we think, of uh, volunteer work on this aircraft. Uh, there's uh, over a million dollars worth of money, but it doesn't mean anything when you realize what that aircraft stands for and the heritage that it represents as far as those who flew and those who died for freedom. It's, it's just so wonderful to be part of something that's going to perpetuate that story. took off at dusk and there was line squalls of lightning like a double line running north and south and we gained altitude of about 12,000 feet and we were flying pretty well due south such that we were in a dark valley between these two lines of squalls and there was a moon up and was shining on the east face of the, the right-hand clouds. There was a bit of sun still tipping the tops of the higher clouds on the east side. And here you had little crimson tips here, moons over here, lightning all the way along, lightning all the way along. And here we are running in the trough in between these two parallel stars. And that was magnificent sight. It's what I never forgot. How about, how do you tune it? How do you tune the frequencies? Well, that's a little complicated. You sort of have to find the frequencies that you need, and then you do some tuning here with these knobs here. But uh, for me to explain it to you is uh, 
let's face it, I haven't done this for 60 years. 